so we're going to talk about uh, biological activity in Minnesota groundwaters, focusing on groundwater here, and the biological activity as a whole, which we'll see is highly linked to uh, ammonia in the water. You also need phosphorus as well, but in oxygen. So those are the, kind of the key things, but um, so getting into it, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, recon oops, recognize uh, Lehin Rizania. A lot of the research that was done with regards to trying to find out why Minnesota had so much copper exceedances um, goes back to her investigating that and us uh, kind of working back and forth through the years. And it's over a process of almost uh, 15 years, we figured to fully come full circle and say, oh, it's due to really biological activity, a lot of this corrosion a lot of the issues we see uh, with regards to uh, copper at the taps. <coughs> so historically, first coming to Minnesota from a, a national firm, thinking iron and manganese removal, just focusing, and typically in the area we focus on just the chemical and physical mechanisms. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on there, but basically your filtration and your oxidation, sequestration, some of those things. But kind of foreshadowing to the complexity here in the green shaded area. Well, got to east of not hitting that laser. <laughs> Brian Noma's. It's this Brian Noma's equipment that's the problem here. Yeah, I think I'm trying to. There we go. So this green shade is there the complexity that of the active mechanisms that are actually occurring in ammonia, whether we realize it or not. If you have ammonia in your system, you probably have some of these things happening. If you're seeing things like, um, you know, sloughing off your filters occasionally and you haven't checked your water for ammonia, as we're going to see, that might be the case that a biological film is naturally wanting to form on your media. You're feeding chlorine, maintaining a residual through that filter, and then you're getting this occasional sloughing because you're kind of, you know, breaking the uh, polymeric arms that they're holding on to each other with and you're getting them to slough off in the system when you don't want them to. You know, a lot of things like taste and odor, if you don't know where you are in your chlorine breakpoint curve, your ratios of chlorine to ammonia, you could be getting chlorine odors in your water and actually feeding more chlorine might be the answer to reduce that odor. And as we're gonna see, making sure you have the, the same point on the breakpoint curve if you have like 21 wells. So I'm just kind of <coughs> foreshadowing here some of the things we're gonna look at to get you thinking. I'm not liking this. Uh, um, and then again, as I alluded to, pH impacts, uh, copper corrosion levels, corrosion in your system. So let's start with uh, kind of the simple, the chlorine uh, breakpoint curve. Obviously, you have chlorine and ammonia. You're going to get chloramines. Um, another thing to think about, if uh, just when you're checking for free chlorine, you want to check that right away. They found that if you have... Uh, chlorine and ammonia, if you, if you see that gradual turning to uh, a pink, the pink phantom, that oftentimes is not due to uh, actual uh, free chlorine. Then find the point we're going to look at here in a second, a slide about the breakpoint curve. Try and find out where each of your wells were for the chlorine level you're feeding, where you sit on that breakpoint curve. If you understand that, you can understand a lot of what's happening in terms of taste and odors. And then to know the odor thresholds, basically just you're going up, you know, one, two, three, mono, di, tri. Your, your threshold for being able to smell that chlorine or that swimming pool type odor is getting lower and lower. That's why if you're going to go combine chlorine, you kind of want to be on that rise of, the, uh, rise of the curve. And if you're going to go free, you should shoot for about 85% free. So this is, looks real complex, but I think the big thing to learn here is you're going up, up the curve for monochloramine, and that's to ratio about five to one of chlorine to ammonia's nitrogen. And then as you go from a ratio of five to one, uh, chlorine to ammonia to 10 to one, then you're reaching your breakpoint curve. That's kind of a generality. Sometimes I see you can go a lot farther up that curve if you actually test the water. Sometimes it's more at 7.6 your breakpoint. But in general, if you're going to go combined, you'd like to be on this part of the curve here. You start to get more, more odor again because these have a uh, higher threshold before you can smell it, lower threshold, and the worst is 
it's not a big area, but that uh, trichloramine there. And then know that this zone here too is just your oxidizing your iron, your hydrogen sulfide, yeah. Well, 85%, if you have a total, 85% should, should, should be free and the other 15% should be combined. Seems like this thing is. So, um, here's a, so, Think about working your ammonia to eliminate the odor. Um, so the dyno is a case where you had 21 wells, and they just said, well, let's just feed the same chlorine at all the wells. And they're constantly having these kind of migrating odor complaints, and it seemed to be depending on which, uh, which wells they turned on, which wells they were running. So you can think if there's different ratios of chlorine to ammonia because you're feeding the same exact chlorine, but you have different levels of ammonia, then depending on which wells you have on, a person might be getting a different type of chloramine, a different point on that chlorine breakpoint curve. And sometimes it's not even that it smells worse, it's just that it smells or tastes different. And people get used to how the water smells, so they get calls. It was just a, an ongoing issue. So we did some uh, jar testing um, to try and identify where for each well, you know, what the chlorine breakpoint curve, and actually did the speciation of what was, how much monochloramine you'd have for a given ratio, how much dichloramine, how much free, how much total. Um, and then we targeted the same chlorine to ammonia ratio at each well. So here's just one curve for well 17. So you can see here, here's the mono, that's kind of what we like. That's rising up the curve. Here's where your total kind of drops. So here's their breakpoint. According to this, isn't that 10 to 1? It was more like, no, that's chlorine added, so that's not a ratio. But anyway, the, the ratio here, 5 to 1 is what we identified, is it's a nice amount of, uh, um, nice amount of monochloramine. And so they just said for every well, they're not going to feed the same amount of chlorine they're going to feed to get that ratio. And they set all their rotometers and everything that way, and all the problems went away. So another active uh, mechanism when you have ammonia in water, whether, whether you want it to happen or not, there's a potential for, and Dave's going to talk a little about, about this, this is called nitrification. When you have ammonia, it can go to nitrite, and then from nitrite to ni nitrate. If you're wastewater guys, you're familiar with that. It consumes alkalinity, but we have lots of alkalinity in our Minnesota groundwater, so that's not limiting. So if you, uh, if you don't have a strong enough disinfectant residual or you have a lot of residence time, that can start to occur. So chloramines are good disinfectors. They're not very good at stopping the nitrifiers. So if you are going to go out with a combined chlorine, you should shoot for like two milligrams per liter of combined chlorine. So two milligrams per liter of like monochloramine. And that's about what we did in that Adina study. It was about that two ratio and then we, that two a residual and we were shooting for that five to one ratio. Um, something, I don't know that this has happened, but it's potential because you saw that we're going from ammonia to nitrite. If for some reason they'd run out of oxygen or something or couldn't continue to nitrify, you theoretically could exceed your, your nitrite standard, which is one milligram per liter. And you can also get you know, the potential for, uh, for that to happen. So anyway, the goal for ammonia in the system, as Brian Nome is going to talk about for ammonia, is zero. Another thing that ties into this is residence time. One of the uh, studies I did was for the 934 airlift wing, um, which is served by the city of Minneapolis. So they're planning to have all these people on the base, so it's sized for you know all these showers and meals and all this activity happening. Well, they're not staffed to that level. So you've got these huge mains with water that has ammonia intentionally added to it. It gets warm in the summer. You get these really long residence times. And then you gradually start, you know, the nitrifiers can find places to hide, un hide under bio films and things like that. So you just would start to get this nitrification and their lead levels were just going through the roof because with the nitrification, your pH drops. So residence time is key to think about too if you're having 
if you can do things uh, to control that. Because basically, with residence time, your chlorine levels tend to drop, microbial activity goes up. With that, your, your ammonia, chlorine to ammonia levels will start to change because you start going, uh, you start to, to consume some of your chlorine. pH can drop, which that is what increases to the lead and copper level. And that, as we're going to see, is how some of the work we ended start to really identify what was causing these elevated copper levels we'd see. Thanks. <clears throat> so with that, that's where we get, you know, we're working on this, seeing all the stuff that ammonia adds. It's complexity. That is the pH impacts, and CCTT is corrosion control treatment. And with that, Dave's going to tag team jump in here. I, I, everyone can hear me, right? Wow, a lot of people here. <clears throat> so what does this have to do with ammonia? Can anyone explain this to me? <laughs> this is out in front of my house a few weeks ago, and I live in St. Cloud. And I come home from work about 5 o'clock, and this is what I see in front of my house, about a foot and a half of water, maybe two feet. And this is one of the coldest nights there was in St. Cloud. I tell you, the guys from St. Cloud showed up. And uh, hi, Steve. There's Steve Berkland. He's your uh, chair of Minnesota Rural Waters, giving me a face in the back, so I got to make fun of him, too. <laughs> Anyways, so I come home, and uh, these guys from St. Cloud come out there. And they do not get paid enough. I'll guarantee you. They're waiting around in this water. <laughs> they don't. And I, I, I actually sent a letter to the mayor explaining what a great job they did and that they're underpaid and they need to get more pay. I never got a response, but I sent them a letter. <laughs> but they were out there waiting around trying to find a catch basin to unthought so they can uh, get rid of this water. I went out to dinner. We didn't have water at our place, so my wife and I went out to dinner. We came back, all that water was gone. That next morning, they were there at 7 o'clock in the morning digging, fixing that leak. That leak was up around the corner about a half a block. So they did a fantastic job. Anyone here from St. Cloud? Okay. Well, anyways, they uh, deserve a big applause, that's for sure. Don't worry, be happy. That's what he was looking at, going like, okay, how in the world am I going to get out to that catch basin? So actually what they did is they took a truck, and he sat in the back, and he had a metal detector looking for that catch basin. And then when he found it, he just chopped it open. That's how he did it, got rid of that water. And so what does that have to do with the water or ammonia in water? Well, St. Cloud adds ammonia to their water, and many people do. That's to form monochloramines, a different type of disinfection. And so why should we care about ammonia? The common thinking, it's not regulated. Who cares? Confusing chemistry, maybe if we don't ask, no one will tell. So we started looking at this thing back, oh, several years ago, probably 87, 86. And our phase one of our uh, study was to look at several systems out there in Minnesota. And we looked at uh, their point of entries, and we tested for ammonia. We tested for nitrites, we tested for nitrates, DO, and we found pretty astonishing numbers. That we found a lot of ammonia out there. And why were we looking for ammonia? It was because several systems in the state of Minnesota failed their lead and copper, and it was the copper part that they failed. In fact, Minnesota was the highest copper exceedances in the state or in the whole United States. So we were number one in copper exceedances. And why was that? We were on a hunt. Steve, you got to look at me. OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, maybe we put that in the wrong spot. Did we skip one? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe did we? The phase two part of our study was to look at specific sites. And we picked out several of them. And we wanted to track what happens to these cities throughout uh, the summertime. And what we found out that several of these systems had ammonia. 
Uh, they had ammonia at their point of entry, and through the summer times, nitrification occurred out in the distribution systems. And we found out in all the systems that we picked, every single one of them had high ammonia, and every single one of them failed their lead and copper, and their copper portion was the big part. And that was our phase two. We did a lot of uh, field analysis. 50% uh, of our systems had nitrification in the distribution systems. Should I go back to those others now? Okay. At first, we started thinking dissolved oxygen was a big part of it. You know, we started looking at systems. Uh, we had found a correlation of high DO in the water and um, high copper levels in their water. So we thought, well, maybe high DO was causing our copper corrosion out in the distribution system. And that wasn't the fact. The high DO was feeding the bugs to cause nitrification and turning that ammonia into nitrates, and that was more of a problem. It's not all our problems, but it's a big chunk of it. Our two cities in the state that we uh, first started looking at was Wilmer. They had ammonia at about three parts per million. Uh, you can see their pH is 8.1. Uh, their copper exceedance level, 90% was 4.1. Hutchinson, they had ammonia levels about 1.7. Both towns took different paths. Hutchinson's put in a brand new treatment system. They went with reverse osmosis for 50% of the treatment, and then they went biological for 50% of the treatment. It works well. Their ammonia problems went away. Where Wilmer actually looked at feeding a chloride ion, which is supposed to minimize nitrification out in the distribution system. And it worked well for about a year, and then it's slowly not working as well. And so they're still experiencing problems out in the distribution system and seeing those nitrite levels go above one out in the distribution. In the health department, here's the key, is EPA regulates nitrites at the point of entry. And so the point of entry, if it's not over one, you don't have a problem. The problem is nitrification doesn't happen at the point of entry. It happens out in the distribution system. And so when we go out and we start seeing nitrites over one, and what's the problem with nitrites? Methemoglobinemia, blue baby, you know, it's kind of a bad thing. So the health department now is if we find nitrites out in your distribution system over one, we're going to enforce that on you. The systems have to make some corrections out there. Okay. So DO is essential. Onamia, Tom, I see is in the uh, audience here. He uh, has two wells in his town. He has well number three. Uh, and as you can see, you have that laser pointer I could borrow? Yeah. Thank you. Well number three has about two parts of ammonia. Well, well number four has about seven parts of ammonia. This is back in 08 when we first started looking at this. Well number three has high iron, manganese, taste and odor problems. They don't like to use it. So they were primary wells, well number four. And uh, with that much ammonia, we thought for sure we're going to find nitrification out in their distribution system. It's got to be there. But what happened is blue is ammonia, that yellow is nitrates, and usually if you get nitrification, that blue goes away and the yellow takes over. Uh, so your ammonia goes away and it converts to a nitrate. Well, out in the distribution systems, we didn't find nitrification. Nothing was happening there. And what was, the, what was the main thing that was causing this? Their DO levels uh, at their well were very low. Their treatment is a little polyphosphate, a little chlorine, and then pumps it out in the distribution system. Everything out in the distribution system, their DO was very low. So if you don't have dissolved oxygen out in your distribution system, you won't have nitrification happening. As soon as you introduce oxygen through a recirculation pump or, you know, maybe a, a tower if you get air into it, you can get nitrification stratification happening in those areas. Lafayette was another town that we looked at. And uh, you can see 
it back in 08, they had pretty high levels of ammonia, two and a half part, and the other one was about part and a half. But off the treatment plant, you started seeing the ammonia going away. You started seeing nitrites creep up, and their nitrates creeping up. So this, this filter was trying to go biologically active. But where it was really happening was out in the distribution system. City offices was two blocks away from the treatment plant. All the ammonia was gone. It was totally converted over to nitrates. So nitrification is happening out in the distribution system. This town was feeding four parts per million of chlorine at the filter plant. Two blocks away could not get a chlorine residual. So good indication that nitrification, lots of biological activity, and they, you know, is gobbling up all that chlorine. Pardon me? Okay. So our third phase, I call it, is our uh, general chemistry study that was done in, throughout the state, and I think everyone here has been sampled for it now. And we went out, we specifically looked for the general chemistry, hardness, iron, manganese, but we wanted to look at ammonia, nitrite, nitrates, to see what was happening out in the distribution systems. This is uh, information that was sampled or collected maybe three quarters of the way through. 2,444 wells. You can see over 90% of those wells have some sort of ammonia. A lot of it's at the lower levels, the 0.02 to 0.29, but that can cause you problems on your distribution system. You can get nitrification happening out there. But there are several of them that are in the higher range. Okay. And this is just uh, out in the distribution systems where we had higher levels of ammonia at, at here. They're shifting to the lower levels or actually going away which is a good indication that nitrification is happening in a lot of the systems out there. So, some of you people might be wondering, what the heck is nitrification? And it can be confusing, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can here. And basically, it's ammonia, and you get a bug that eats ammonia and converts it to nitrite. That's where your nitrites are formed. And then there's another bug it eats up the nitrites and converts it to a nitrate. And that's usually your end source of nitrification unless you get into a denitrification, low oxygen conditions, and you can actually gas that nitrate off into a nitrogen gas. So in a nutshell, the nitromonas eating up the uh, ammonia, the nitrites, the nitrobacters eating up the nitrites, convert it to a nitrate. Sound familiar to some of the wastewater people out there? <laughs> exactly. It's the exact same process. But this is happening out in distribution systems and water systems throughout Minnesota. So we have all these little mini, don't tell anyone, wastewater plants throughout <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> and we have to deal with it, you know. We can't ignore it anymore. We, we know the problems out there. And we have to deal with it. So how do you deal with ammonia? You deal with it before it gets out in the distribution system. That's the key in my opinion. And there are several ways to do with it. Okay, Simon's our new engineer with the health department. I'm gonna pick on him. Can you explain this ammonia cycle for us? Just kidding. <laughs> I can. It gets pretty complicated. I mean, if you sit down and look at it, you know, I'm sure some of the wastewater people can understand that like uh, thing. But it looks pretty complicated. But it really is a little bit simpler than it looks. Here's a big problem that we run into a lot. If you have multiple wells out in your distribution system, okay, varying concentrations of ammonia, you see a problem here, especially if they feed at different spots. So if someone doesn't have any chlorine and you're feeding, I mean, any ammonia and you're feeding chlorine, you might be feeding free chlorine off that well. You go over to another part of town and they have high ammonia in that well, well, you're probably feeding monochloramines with excess of free. And so you get all these wells with different chlorination, you know, some are monochloramine, some are free, and so you get this incompatibility, and it gets out in the distribution systems. Some people are complaining about chlorine taste, 
Other people are fine. Some people have nitrification, taste and odor problems, yucky water. Other people are fine. So you get this incompatibility. So you really need to know what's out in your distribution system. So what is biological filtration? And this is an up and coming term. And I think um, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good treatment technique for the higher levels of ammonia and it works well. And it's starting to take off and that's why we're developing policies for it. But basically you're mimicking uh, what nature does. Because um, in the groundwater if you have ammonia, these bacteria are in there too. So you have to create the right environment for this bacteria to take off to convert it to a nitrate. And that's basically what it is. There's little bugs out there, Nitromonas, Nitrobacter, eating up that ammonia, converting it to nitrates. So what did we do? A bag, borrowed, and stole equipment, and we built a little mobile pilot plant. And this is it. And Tom over at Anemia was gracious enough to uh, let us park it there for a long, long time. And we are trying to mimic uh, what the city does. So when their pumps kick on, this plant kicks on. When it kicks off, the plant kicks off. So it's a little bit difficult. You know, a lot of these pilot plants run 24 seven. It's a little easier for them to get good results. I wanted to mimic exactly what the city was doing. And the problem is, you know, Namia, we're actually running this in the wintertime right now, too. It's amazing it hasn't froze up. But it's still working. The, uh, the biological treatment has gone down a little bit. Uh, in the summertime, we're totally removing all the, the uh, ammonia. In the wintertime, we're not quite getting all of the ammonia. We're tweaking it a little bit. But what happens in the wintertime? People don't use as much water. And I don't know how many hours you think you pump a day about three hours a day. Yeah, so it doesn't run a lot. So we're working with it. We're, we're finding the ins and outs. And there's a few key elements that, uh, that are real crucial for biological filtration. And number one is air. Air delivery and the uh, air that these things consume. The other one is phosphorus. The other one is calcium, but we have lots of alkalinity, and that's a calcium source for this biological filtration. So that's usually not a problem. Next. So what does this stuff look like? There it is. This is in our detention tank. This is some of the biological activity that's happening. This stuff grows on anything. I mean, it grows on plastic. I got, this is pea rock. I threw pea rock in there just to try that out. Uh, we have GAC filters we're running. We're running sand anthracite. Mm -hmm. We're trying a lot of different things, but basically this stuff grows on anything. There's a lot of biological plants that are popping up throughout the state right now. One's in Wilmer, um, small town outside of St. Cloud here, St. Martin's running one. Uh, Lincoln Pipestone's doing a denitrification, they're removing high nitrates and uh, gassing that off into a nitrogen gas as a treatment technique. They have reverse osmosis right now, got into a little trouble with uh, the wastewater side, and so now they're looking at an alternative method to deal with it, and one of them was biological, and it seems to work fairly well. And this is why the health department's looking at developing these policies and Just some more info. And if you don't think it costs you money, I gotta tell you a story. It's about a larger town, I'm not gonna say who it is. But uh, got a call one day and they buy half their water from a different town. And they said, Dave, you gotta come. We, we need some help. Uh, this larger town centered us some bad water. We have nitrification happening. We can't keep chlorine residuals. We're in trouble. Can you come and do some testing for us? So I went into the town. Um, he wanted to take me over where they pumped that water into a ground storage reservoir. And I said, no, let's go to your plant first and see what you got, what you're doing. My first sample off that plant, their ammonia levels were super high. And I go, well, what's going on here? He goes, well, I don't know. We test it daily. And I go, can I see your information? And uh, 
he went back and he looked through his computer and pulled out the information. Well, it's been high ever since day one. It's been super high the whole time. And I go, well, what's going on here? He goes, well, we're feeding it at the four to one ratio we're supposed to. I go, have you ever checked your groundwater? He goes, no, why? He goes, well, we've been finding high ammonia in your groundwater. Sure enough, their groundwater had high levels of ammonia, plus they were feeding ammonia on top of that. And they were creating their own problems out there. So this town, he, I, he was getting pretty flabbergasted, so I just left him alone. And I uh, said, well, we'll talk tomorrow. Six o'clock that next morning at home, I get a call from him. Dave, I didn't sleep all night. I did some reading and I looked at this stuff. We don't need to feed ammonia, do we? I go, no, you don't. So they turn off their ammonia. Um, he says their chlorine residuals over time went up out in the distribution systems so they could lower their chlorine residuals. They're not feeding ammonia anymore. They said they're saving this town about $400,000 annually a year just recognizing that they had excess ammonia in their, their water. So if you don't think it's going to cost you, it will. And Steve, this is yours. Sounds good. A little. <clears throat> so yeah, kind of where Dave left off. Another thing, so I was involved in uh, uh, helping write the lead and copper rule guidance manual before I came to Minnesota. So that led to the interest in um, copper corrosion. But another thing I did is I kept track of their like filter manual and did little filter evaluations when I was there. And I kind of continued that as a passion here in Minnesota. So I've probably done 20 some around and start to run into these, these plants where um, oftentimes they were uh, like sloughing and they were, were getting occasional upsets in their system. And they call me out and they said, well, yeah, our water has been great for the last three, four years because we one day just ran out of uh, chlorine and we just quit sh you know, feeding pre-filtered chlorine for a while and all these little upsets just went away. So we said, well, why start feeding it again? And it works great because they get rid of this uh, biofilter, you know, sloughing. Um, but the pro and a little bit, the plugging slows down because this stands for extra polymeric substances and that's just the little arms, the the little nitrobacters and stuff throw out the hold on to the sand or whatever so that the food and the air is coming by and they can grab it and have a little uh, food party in your filter. Um, if you stress them with chlorine, they actually usually grow more of those arms. The wastewater guys will recognize that too. Sometimes if they're stressed, you get more filamentous type nature. But still over time, and it usually seems to be that four years, you can put almost four times, four to five times as much water through a biologically active filter and still get good iron and manganese removal. So gradually their filter is plugging up and it doesn't seem to affect the head either because these guys are so kind of slippery. I guess is the best way to say it, the water just shoots right by them. But eventually you can't, you get down to, if you four fifths of it is plugged, you only have, you know, a fifth of the area and that's where you start getting into the problems where now we're starting to not be able to filter as much. And that's usually when I, get called out there and you'd look at it and say, well, your filter's gone biological, because even if you're still feeding um, permanganate oftentimes, it's not a real strong um, disinfectant, it's a good oxidizer. But without the chlorine there, the bugs are free to just grow and they get some good results of not having that uncontrolled sloughing when they don't want it, but now they're here on this end of the equation. And here's a little, kind of you can see the filamentase that filamentous nature. And again, that's called that extra polymeric. Well, there's different acronyms I've heard for this, but I just call it extra polymeric substances. Easiest way to remember. And so here's some of the things, you know, you take core samples and this is a filter that's very biological. You can see the, the look uh, very similar to that peanut butter type look you saw on uh, Dave's pilot plant. But I've also seen it where it looks like um, when you have more manganese, oxidation, manganese uh, oxidizing bacteria present, it'll look like uh, special, what's that cereal, special K, like the small cornflakes ones coated with like that almond, that black almond bark chocolatey stuff, you know, you coat the pretzels with at Christmas, look exactly like that, just little flakes all over. 
Um, and that sometimes the coating then on your sand will be very, very dark. But you'll find sometimes like more dark nodules. And the sludge is more treatable, actually, more settable than uh, uh, chemically oxidized iron and manganese sludge. So again, here I'm pointing out that uh, permanganate provided good oxidation, but uh, little disinfection, and also you're usually not feeding enough. You don't want to feed so much you have pink water, so you're feeding enough just to oxidize your permanganate, and if you're not feeding chlorine, it's also going to oxidize your, excuse me, your manganese and your iron, but still probably nothing much going on to your filter, or at least not all the way through the filter. Um, so they're unaware that the water quality events previously were due to sloughing, you know, due to the breaking the arms of your little polymeric substances and those sloughing to occur. That kind of brings up a question, too, that Brian Nomina and Department of Health have been talking about, is uh, if you have other contaminants in your water, like arsenic, which is co-absorbed, you know, when you uh, remove iron, it's absorbed on your iron flock, is it better or worse to have a biologically active filter? Well, in some cases, it seems like it almost be better because you get less sloughing. And if you get your iron, your your you know, your stuff sloughing off your filters, well, that's going out in the system. I'm sure the arsenic is still absorbed. I don't think that's been studied yet, but this is just some brainstorming um, we're doing. <coughs> so some of the things uh, you do here in a filter evaluation, maybe you've seen presentations where you take a sample, like a 50 milligram sample of uh, media, you'll shake it, do a rinse, do that five times, Check the turbidity, and there's certain like you want to be, you know, below 300 to avoid, avoid forming mud ball. Well, these filters would just be off the charts. I mean, because there's so much coating on the media, it'd be you know thousands. Um, but yet they're still getting, like I said, up to four to five times as much gallons per per square foot. S doesn't seem to affect head loss problems. Continue to achieve excellent removal. Um, Here's kind of one of the problems, and again, you can go up to the point of having four-fifths of the bed plugged, and that's, here we are kind of seeing, as we're back washing a filter, how much of that media is fluffing up so you could take like a, a pipe or something and move it without resistance in the bed. <coughs> and we see that backwash rate is another thing that can be impacted, and the method with which you backwash. So if you're going to go to a biologically active filter, or you're going to change something where your filter might be able to go biological, like not feeding chlorine before the filter. Before doing that, you need to make sure you thought, am I going to be able to get the backwash rate that I need to break these, uh, these, these guys off of my filter medium when I want to? Because your filter weir design is based on just assuming it takes a certain amount of flow can get through that clean media with three feet of head loss. So those weirs, you, if you have a plant that's based on a weir level, well, when you have these guys holding on to each other, now you're not lifting one piece of media, you're, pick, you're lifting one and a half, or you know, two and a half, or three and a half, and then you get more, more head loss required. So is what more head loss uh, impacted. So here's a plant that you have like a weir for backwash overflow. So here's, imagine that at the bottom of this wall, you have your filter effluent filling up that. So it's coming out through your filter, comes up over this wall. The height of this wall above your filter backwash trough is normally three feet. But once your filter gets, media, gets dirty, you, the head loss of that water going through there to lift that media where they're hanging onto each other takes more energy. You're lifting not just one piece of media, but a few pieces of media. So three feet's not enough. So now a higher proportion of that water just spills over the backwash trough, and your filter doesn't get backwash as good that time. Then the next time you go to backwash, instead of three feet, four feet, it takes five feet. So even more water spills over. So it's a vicious cycle. In other words, your standard plant designed for physical chemical removal of iron and manganese will not sufficiently keep a biologically active filter clean. So that's what we see, that three foot head, your extra polymeric substances lead to greater and greater head required for the backwash of a biological filter. Water keeps on taking the path of least resistance. And so is what you need to do is something like, here's this blue pipe is added. So, you know, from your high service pumps or maybe from your distribution system, you have orifice plates and the like, get the reduction in head you need so you can direct connect. So this is a direct connect pipe and you force the amount of water you need, whether it's whatever head loss occurs, occurs, you're shooting for a certain flow <clears throat> to get that gallons per square foot you need.
And also, it <clears throat> seems really to me that you would want to have uh, air wash. I've seen some filters that haven't needed it, but the air scour combined air water backwash to, to break those arms up. Because again, we want to break off any of the weak links when we're backwashing. We don't want to happen when we're filtering. Uh, so another things with the active when you have ammonia presence, this is more if we're designing it probably intentionally. But you're going to, just like we saw reduction of DO in the distribution system, you're going to use up dissolved oxygen in your plant. Now, theoretically, if you look at all the, the requirements for iron, manganese, and ammonia removal with a biologically active filter, they'd say you probably have to add air, then you need to have an iron filter, then you need to add air again and have another filter for manganese and ammonia, you know, three stages basically. But what I've seen in the field is sometimes you're getting all of it done basically in a filter. So it can be somewhat of an art and based on experience, but also you can think if you're getting your oxidation, let's say of your iron <clears throat> by adding enough chlorine so it doesn't make it to the filter, well then you've taken care of your iron. So there's ways to, if you want to intentionally have a biologically active plant to save costs to avoid having to have three separate filters and that can all be piloted. And then as Dave mentioned, there's, you know, there's the carbon, uh, nitrogen, and the phosphorus are all needed for biological activity. So some places you might need to, have to, have to actually add a touch of phosphoric acid or sometimes if they don't have enough of that, they'll stress and they throw out more of these, these arms. Whether you throw chlorine at them or not enough phosphorus, they throw out more arms and they plug up your bed faster than you want them to. And this is ATP is uh, adenosine, I think triphosphate or something like that. Just as it's a nice surrogate, it probably want to be a constant measure, but it lets you know what your kind of biological activity is. So you can measure it if you think something's stressed. You could kind of track that as a surrogate measure of the health of your filter. And this is kind of more leaning towards the. I guess the more technical side of intentionally, um, of intentionally uh, getting a biologically active filter. Again, stress of any time, whether it's due to disinfectant or not having the proper ratios of food that they want, can lead to clogging and head loss due to insufficient uh, nitrate uh, nutrients due to a pH. P there's an optimum pH range too, usually for each type, pH and uh, ORP, oxygen, oxygen. Oxidation reduction potentials, ORP. Here's, the, here's a theoretical ratio of uh, carbon, nitrogen to phosphorus. And sometimes you have to actually add the phosphorus is the main thing. We're not, we have plenty of carbon with all the alkalinity in our water. And I don't know if anyone's been added, ever added ammonia because I don't know, I don't think that's happened. Usually it's we have the natural occurring ammonia enough to have this occur. In that little map of Minnesota, you can see kind of around the metro out to the west and to the south. There's enough ammonia. <clears throat> oh, another thing here that I don't is um, if you do have too much plugging of your media, sometimes a hydrogen peroxide has been found to be good to help control the plugging. It's not, doesn't act as a disinfectant, but it helps uh, mitigate that. In terms of biological nitrification, I think Dave's looking at that at some of his pilot studies. Um, oxygen needs usually limit the reaction there. It's kind of what we saw like onamia. I mean, you have eight parts. Was that what it was? Something of ammonia. And if you haven't, don't have any air in the water, it just stays ammonia out in the system. And that's something to think uh, too, like I'm doing a uh, water plant in the metro right now and they intentionally add ammonia and but they don't have they just have wells they don't have a treatment plant so we're really thinking we need to probably going to put an ammonia room but have the uh, chemical to be added by the contractor you know at a given cost up to a year later if we see if it's really needed because now we're not sure if you want to be adding ammonia to the system if it's going to cause a nitrification probably and maybe cause uh, you know lead and copper issues we kind of think potentially and just talked with Department of Health, Lee and Rosanya and others that that's probably more of a risk than having exceeding the disinfectant byproducts 
uh, rule because there's not a lot of TOC in this water. So whenever you're changing something, you need to think, you know, what are the impacts? And think about anemia with eight parts of ammonia. If they tried to breakpoint chlorinate that, it'd be really expensive. So, so if you need 10 parts and they have eight, you'd need 80 parts of chlorine. <coughs> Uh, so some of the things, this is Darren Little, it's a really good uh, paper if you want his information, we can get it to you, but basically almost more of a small gra gravel, so you're almost running this thing almost more like a trickling filter in wastewater, and you're not even really backwashing, like lifting the media at all, you're just kind of flushing it out to get the attached growth off. And they just continuously bubble air up through the bed to keep the DO saturated, so you kind of have air coming up through the bed water flowing down through the bed, and it's been found to be very effective, cost-effective means, probably less expensive than a filter that you have to backwash and get real fancy with. But you still need to keep the, the ratio of your uh, nutrients proper. So I'm running out of time here. So here's what we've added. We start with just the chemical and physical mechanisms, but whether we want to uh, have it happen or not, when we have ammonia present in the water, these, all these things could potentially be active. And that's it. So if you have any questions for Dave or I, I guess we can have a couple minutes here. Uh, hi, my name is Brian Nome. I work for the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm also known as the plan review guy. Um, um, I've been at the department for about uh, 25 years and one of my jobs there is to review construction plans before they get uh, built. So um, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we developed a policy for biological water treatment. Um, I guess uh, previously in the I guess in the Hutchinson era and the uh, city of St. Paul, St. Paul regional water era, uh, our, our philosophy used to be as long, if you're gonna try bio biological treatment, we're gonna require you to disinfect going out and that was it. But now with the uh, increase, uh, increased interest in biological treatment, we realize that it's a little bit more than that. And so um, there's been uh, several projects that were coming up and proposing pilot studies. And so we decided to take another look at this. So. Um, this will kind of describe our process of going through that. Um, so the overview of the uh, presentation today, we'll, we'll talk a little bit why policy is needed, um, dealing with alternative technologies, uh, developing state standards and policies, and then uh, pilot study requirements and outcome. Uh, best practices, uh, compliance standards that we have to meet, uh, plan review process, and then conducting inspections. So. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly since um, there's another speaker after this. If you're looking uh, to leave at 11, that's, uh, we're going to go over past 11 o'clock here. So, I'll say, so here's um, why a policy is needed. We saw an increase in the number of communities that wanted to look at biological treatment. And um, I think we had probably six to eight communities that had come to us and said, hey, we want to do this. And uh, would, would we be allowed to do this? And uh, so as we thought about it, we kind of said, I think for years the, the, the message has always been bugs are bad and so we don't like bugs so kill all the bugs you can. But that is not what this is about. So we decided yeah we should probably take a look at this and, and the other thing that I think that through us folks that have spent our lives in the public health field is that um, we're kind of leery about the wastewater side of things. So we don't and we know this is kind of a wastewater technology but um, that's something that we're not really well versed in. So. Um, we also decided that a policy would help us create a more level playing field. So how to deal with proposals that come in. We don't like to treat anybody special or different than anybody else. And I think um, this also allows uh, the consultants and the communities that want to do this. It, it sets the expectations of what we want and what we're looking for. And then um, so that there's no hidden surprises later. So biological treatment is in this uh, category of alternate, alternative treatment technologies. 
which membrane filtration, ozone treatment, uh, UV light, and advanced oxidation those are all part of. So as we look at these um, types of treatment technologies, we require that um, pilot studies be done for these type of proposed treatment systems. Um, currently, there's not a lot out there on biological um, treatment other than papers that have been published. So like this manual, I, I put this manual up here as an example is a lot of times you can, when you're looking at different treatment technologies, you can go to a manual or a document like this and kind of figure out what AWA is publishing on the matter. There currently is not a document like this that we can go to. So um, this is going to, this presentation is going to explain a little bit about what we had to go through in order to um, put our policy together. So we look for uh, EPA uh, guidance documents. Um, we also look at what other states are doing. Um, we're not the only ones that are doing this. Um, we also look for 10 state standards for waterworks to see what's in that document. And then um, we attend uh, conferences and webinars um, to see what, what's the latest on this topic, try to get up to speed on, on what's going on. And then we also meet with uh, experts and interested parties. In this case, we actually met and, and put some of this information out to the eight or so communities that are thinking of doing biological treatment. And when we came up with a rough draft of a policy, we actually sent it out to those folks and said, take a look at this and see if this is something that, is, that you could live with or if this is acceptable. Um, one of the things I've always kind of told people is that it seems like when somebody proposes a new or an alternative technology, that the state regulators are always trying to play catch up with everybody else. It seems like they have got a little bit of a head start on us as far as what's going on. And so um, we always are playing a little bit catch up. We need to kind of get up to speed with what's going on, what the terminology is, and what the practices are. And so um, we feel like sometimes we're developing policy under a rushed kind of time frame, but I guess that's just the nature of the beast. Um, we also try to visit the existing plants uh, that might already be in operation. However, um, there's not a, a lot of these out there and most of them are in warm climates. So I think my boss would be really suspect if I asked him to go to like Florida or California in the winter to go look at one of these. So I don't know if that's really gonna happen. Um, the other uh, thing that uh, developing the state, um, state standards and policies is we wanna make sure this can be done in a safe manner um, that we can have drinking water that's uh, clean and safe uh, going out to the systems. And then we also need to determine what are the critical parameters that need to be measured and monitored. So currently right now, um, we're about 99.9% .9 done with the policy. Um, we just gotta do some final last minute revisions, do an internal um, review, and then uh, hopefully it'll be done here in the next month or so. <coughs> but we ended up, we, we went kind of full circle on this. We first started out with four different policies. Then as we wrote it, we decided, hey, these are all very similar. So we molded it all into one. And then as we talked about it, we decided that there's too many different specific uh, things for the different types of treatment. And so we went back to four different policies. So currently what we're dealing with is the, a policy for iron and manganese, biological treatment, uh, one for ammonia, one for nitrate, and one for taste and odor. So if there was another contaminant that you were um, looking at removing through this process, it's not, just because it's not listed here doesn't mean we wouldn't consider it. it we'd probably look at these policies that are going to be written as kind of guidelines on um, what, what we're going to do with, with that particular contaminant. And so we'd kind of do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it would also give us an uh, opportunity to write um, or, or revise these policies that we have. Um, so in this policy that we're going to have, we're, we're looking at things as, such as autom automated monitoring and data collection, um, possibly filter to waste piping in case there's some um, issues as far as uh, taking the filter out of service for a period of time and making sure that the treatment is up and running once the plant's turned on again. Uh, possibly two-stage filtration, although that's probably more for the nitrate removal. And then um, they're also looking at assigning uh, addition, additional points for uh, classifying a system. So if it's a A, B, C, or D license, um, they're also looking at assigning additional points for those um, in, the in the determination of uh, those systems.
Okay, so in the policy, uh, again, I think I covered this a little bit earlier, is, is it outlines expectations for new projects. So when systems want to come and say, hey, can we do this? We're going to, this policy should help outline what the expectations are. We're also providing um, future information. There'll be a, uh, accumulation of a fu future information for folks that want to do this, but want to see how other systems might have approached their problem. Um, this treatment does look very promising. Um, like Hutch has been doing this for quite a while now. And um, the, this uh, biological treatment has been, been done in Europe for, for years. And they don't seem to be having very many problems with it. And it seems to be a very sustainable process. Um, there's a lot less chemical usage. And um, as Steve had explained earlier, there's longer filter runs potentially here. And so there's just, you know, some sustainable uh, items that kind of are, are sustainable uh, practices that might be advantageous to the system. And um, these would also be uh, applicable uh, statewide. So hopefully, uh, where, depending on wherever you are in the state, you could do this kind of treatment. Although one of the things that we've noticed is um, uh, depending on the water temperature, I think most groundwater systems should be okay with this. But if your plant had a design such as the water temperature would drop significantly, there may be some issues there. Because temperature is definitely a critical factor in biological activity. So um, if you were considering doing a pilot study on this type of treatment, here's kind of the steps that we would go through is we'd have a preliminary meeting with a consultant in the community to discuss what the system objectives would be. We both kind of outline what, what, kind of, what our goals are. To, that we'd like to be met. So both uh, our side and, 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 the, and the system would say, here's what we think we want to do. We'd make a list of items that need to be measured or monitored during the pilot test so that we can make sure all the data collection during the pilot study is done and so that you don't have to rerun a test just for something that might have been left out. Um, once that is, is done, we'd take a look uh, at the entire proposal for the study. We'd um, either approve it or have them amend it. And then uh, once that study is complete, we look at a final report and um, review the final report and decide whether the goals were met and whether um, this is a, uh, viable for that specific system. So my example here that I'm going to use is for Lincoln Pipestone. They've actually been through this process. So their uh, Lincoln Pipestone rural water system is piloting biological nitrate removal. And this is an anoxic process uh, with, with low oxygen um, demand for, for the nitrate removal. It does require a, a carbon source addition and so that was kind of thing that little, uh, concerned us a little bit because when you're feeding food to bacteria but you really don't want a lot of bacteria growth, we want to make sure that that can be controlled either through um, you know, the, the food source or through the oxygen or other nutrients. Um, one of the things they found in this uh, pilot study is that um, They've done, the, the company that's uh, doing their pilot study for them, they can do this, and they've shown they can do this in climates such as like Florida or California. When they came up here, they were a little bit leery about this, and they did find that the um, a little bit lower groundwater temperature that they deal with here was a little bit challenging, although they were able to um, overcome those those issues. And here's a, here's a picture of um, their uh, pilot system now out in uh, Lake, ben uh, Lake Benton. Minnesota. Um, these columns were uh, clear columns when they built their pilot study. So actually, um, it, it's kind of hard to see in this diagram here, but when we went out there, you were actually able to see the biological activity, the biomass inside those filters. So, um, so again, uh, with our example, the Lincoln Pipestone has submitted their final report to the Minnesota Department of Health. We're in the process of finishing up that uh, pilot study and issuing a letter to proceed with design. They have a, a bunch of other issues they have to take care of. Um, there are going to be uh, some discharge issues that they need to discharge uh, the backwash to an uh, infiltration pond. Um, there's going to be some biomass in that uh, discharge and so they just need to make sure they can uh, be okay with that as far as um, the PCA permitting and stuff and they're uh, working on getting that taken care of now. And uh, so um, we're kind of this pilot study helped us understand um, what it takes to go through a pilot. They worked with us to help develop our policy. Um, and not only that, we gained a ton of knowledge on 
the different types of biological processes that there are out there. And so, like I said, there were four different policies, and that's how we're going to kind of deal with them for now. But uh, it made us uh, recognize that it's not all the same thing. Um, so my recommendation to folks would be uh, best practices to go through this is that you develop uh, that relationship or build that relationship early in the process. So contact us. Don't be afraid to come to us or to your field, uh, district field engineer and say, hey, this is something we're thinking of doing. Um, try to set uh, that tone early and uh, kind of get a good working relationship. Uh, set clear and concise goals early. Kind of let us know this is what we think we want to do. And we can kind of either say, hey, that looks good, or maybe this is something else you should look at, uh, consider. Um, keeping lines of communication open. Uh, so there's a lot of um, emailing and phone calls and stuff, meetings that we had to attend. Um, but it, it's been good for the process to make sure that the project goes as smooth as possible. And then also establishing a timeline so that everybody knows what the expectations of getting the pilot study and maybe proceeding on to a design, uh, what, what uh, everybody's goals are for that. Um, being flexible for changes or unanticipated issues. This would go for both sides is that some things, um, sometimes things pop up at the last minute and we have to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, we try to plan as much as we can for all those types of issues, but there's bound to be something that will pop up at the end. Um, but we also try to meet uh, regularly uh, to get all those issues ironed out and to update each other on, on projects and, and what timelines we think we can be met and um, keeping good notes. So uh, here's some of the compliance standards that we use when we review things. Um, also the things that we have to comply with uh, by state rule or by law. So here's uh, the left side is the 10 state standards for waterworks. If, um, you guys aren't familiar with this. This is a document that's used in the upper Midwest and Great Lakes region for um, design standards. Um, Minnesota Rules Chapter 4720. Those are the public water supply rules. Oops. The Minnesota Plumbing Code here. Um, those are uh, rules that would uh, regulate the interior plumbing in, in a treatment plant. And then uh, we also have a plan review guide that's currently in the process of being updated. Um, it's very similar and a lot of stuff is taken out of the 10 state standards for that. So the plan review process, once the pilot test results have been reviewed and approved, then they proceed on to design. So we would meet with the, review the pri uh, pilot testing protocol and making sure that the final design gets to that point, um, gets to that same type of design uh, there might be some procurement of specific equipment. We like to say, tell people that uh, what you pilot is really what we want to see in the final project. So if there's something specific that you need to put in there, you might have to procure the specific equipment uh, separately. Um, I, I always like to suggest that we do uh, some plan reviewing um, prior to the final design, so maybe a 30 year 75% and then at the final stage at 100%. That gives everybody an opportunity to look at what the general plan is and what, what people want to do. If we spot things that shouldn't be in there or things that need to be changed, we can make those at an opportunity early enough that uh, those changes can be made with uh, little or no heartburn, I guess. And then um, when we uh, complete our review after the 100% uh, plans are submitted, then we issue a plan review letter and um, we will also perform an interim and, and final inspections uh, during the construction. And uh, when we go out and do the construction inspection, we just refer back to those plan review letters, um, any notes that we would have, um, make sure that the project goals are being met. Uh, we take a lot of pictures during and after construction and then uh, an inspection report is written uh, by the uh, plan uh, or the uh, project inspections uh, inspector. So. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Leon Rosania, Dave Schultz, Chad Colstad, and David Weam. They're uh, the other members of the group that helped put this policy together. Um, so they're as much to credit or blame, I guess, as I am. I got the, I got the opportunity to come up and speak about that and uh, open for any questions. Yes?
Yeah, um, so the question is, is uh, who contacts us? So it can either be you uh, as an operator or your, your water superintendent, they could contact me or they could contact the field engineer. In some cases, it's once you've already hired an engineer, the engineer will come to me. So it could, could, it could be either way. It depends on what, where you are in the process, if you're just kind of thinking of doing this or if you've made the commitment, say we're gonna hire an engineer, we're gonna do this, he might be the person that would come and contact us. Huh? Well, in that, and so that's kind of the purpose of the presentation today was hopefully um, there are some consultants here in the room. They know that. I, I know a lot of the consultants that we deal with on a regular basis, and so we've kind of always had that open door policy, let them know, hey, it's probably to your advantage to come in uh, early, especially on projects that might be a little complicated or not kind of, you know, standard projects. So. Yeah, <laughs> We should talk after this then. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Pretty interesting topic. Let's give these guys a round of applause, please.